about how to cope with controlling people. And this will wrap up here. And there are, uh, let's see, 11 strategies for how to cope. And the first one is, as always, we need to face the controller within. We need to be able to look at ourselves before we dare approach anybody else about their controlling tactics. You might not feel like you having any controlling tendencies in your life, but I dare you to look deep and be honest about it. Ask God to show you where you're struggling with a need to control. Do you ever find yourself getting irritable if things aren't done just the way you'd like them to be? Have you ever become rigid or demanding with others? Do you tend to be perfectionistic? Maybe you truly don't have any of these annoying tendencies, but most of us, if we're to be honest, do. Having some of these tendencies does not automatically qualify you as a control freak. But hopefully recognizing these traits in ourselves will aid us in having a little more patience and empathy with the control freaks around us. Instead of just getting so annoyed, it's good to step back and say, oh, I, I can get where they're coming from. I do that sometimes. Have the courage to pray as the psalmist did in Psalm 139, 23 and 24, when he says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my concerns. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Ask God to show you where you're controlling and he will be prepared. He'll let you know. And then ask him to show you how to get rid of those traits. How do you overcome them? Number two, try not to take it personally. This is hard, folks. Remember that in most cases, control freaks are simply trying to protect themselves first and foremost. They're not trying to hurt you. They're doing whatever they can do to stay in control, to manage their anxiety and their fear. Don't feel responsible or try to make things better for them when they get upset. And here's a tip, accusing them of being controlling is not going to help the situation. It's only going to make them more angry, resentful and controlling. If you continually say, you are so controlling, you've got a problem, you need to deal with this. That's not going to serve you well. Instead, simply let them know how their behavior makes you feel. You could say something like, you might not be aware of this, but whenever we get together, it seems like we always end up doing what you want to do or going where you want to go. And to be honest, I get a little frustrated sometimes. I'd like to have a turn choosing which restaurant we go to eat at. Let them know how you feel and let them know how you'd like things to change. Remember, they're acting this way in an attempt to guard themselves from anxiety. They don't act this way just because they think you're an idiot. There are some controllers that think that, but most are more just trying to manage their anxiety. Try to practice Philippians 2, 3, and 4, which tells us to do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. Rather, in humility, we're to value others above ourselves and not look to our own interests, but we're to look out for the interests of others. This is where empathy comes into play. And I've had this conversation quite a bit lately with more than one person that some people are lacking empathy. It's hard to put somebody else's needs above you, but if you can practice empathy and that's easier for some people than others. Um, and I have been reading lately, I tend to agree with that, that a lot of people lose empathy if they've gone through a lot of trauma. And we have just gone through a huge global trauma with the last three years. And you're finding that people are less and less empathetic and they just do not have the capacity to care or to understand where somebody else is coming from. Even if they used to, they're finding it harder to be empathetic right now. The more you stay in God's word and the more you allow him to change your heart, you will be able to have compassion and mercy and empathy. Now, don't get me wrong. Compassion and mercy and empathy don't mean you have to talk, put up with abuse and inappropriate behavior. It just means it tempers the way you respond to the person. Number three, 
learn to go with their control. Just flow with their control. I know this is going to be hard. This is hard for me. <laughs> it might be difficult going along with the control freaks demands and their need to control you or your actions. But when you go along with them, sometimes that's just what's needed to help them calm down and lighten up a little bit. If they have more confidence in you because you were able to stay calm, then they might lighten up a little bit. There are times when I have controllers who will say the most absurd things to me and make demands. And I will just stop and look at them. And I don't say anything. I just want their words to hang in the air. And they know how unrealistic and unfair their comment was. But then I just do what they ask because it helps to calm them down. Sometimes they need to reflect on their own words and their own expectations. In Isaiah 7, 4, we see how the Lord sent the prophet Isaiah to speak to the king with these words. And the prophet went to the king. He had some people bullying him. And he said, be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Don't lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood. He was talking about two troublesome people. And he called them two smoldering stubs of firewood. <laughs> I think that's what I'm going to use to call the controllers in my life. Because they're angry. Don't pay any attention to them. Just keep calm and it may have an impact on them. Number four, try to identify the emotional need that's fueling your controller. Learn how to diffuse the control freaks around you by finding out what it is they really need right now. Is this person trying to get you to admit that they were right? Is that why they're being so controlling? Or that they're important or they're appreciated or they're intelligent? <laughs> Sometimes people might think I'm controlling because I will say things like, didn't I tell you this? Didn't I tell you this? Didn't I say this? Do you remember me telling you this? And people just shake their head and they say, I get so tired of you saying that, Nancy. I know that. I try really, really hard. But do you know why I say that so much? It's because I've been told for so many times that I was wrong. I was crazy. I was ridiculous. There are times that the emotional need is somebody just wants to be validated. Yes, you did see this. Yes, you did say this would happen. That's how you can diffuse the situation. Maybe they just want to be validated. To cope with control freaks, you need to figure out how to give them what it is they want without sacrificing your own emotional needs or personal values. I had one controller one time tell me, you just don't appreciate what I do for you. You don't understand how hard I work for you. Well, I basically thought it was a pretty mutually responsible relationship, but the individual felt I wasn't recognizing them enough. So I just had to say, yes, I do appreciate it. You have worked very hard and I appreciate all you've done. They didn't want to hear what I'd done. They just wanted me to validate what they had done. I could have said, yeah, well, I did this and you did this and you did this. That wouldn't help the situation. Just wherever you can, give them what they want without sacrificing your own emotional needs. If a control free is acting controlling because of their anxiety about some important meeting they're having at work tomorrow, then help them to understand that fact. Years ago, uh, when my husband first took his job in this job in management, he would come home and be really nasty and mean. And I would tell him, I couldn't figure out what was wrong. I, you know, I didn't cook the right thing for supper or the dishes weren't done and the kids were noisy until I figured out it had nothing to do with me. It had to do with the fact that he was stressed at work. And so I had to help him see that and say, listen, I know this is scary and you feel overwhelmed, but I'm not them. So please don't bring this home to me. Once he's able to see and controllers in general are able to see what the real issue is, it helps them to adjust their behavior and their words. A simple statement from you addressing the issue that's really bothering them can help soothe their anxiety. 
remember in Galatians 6, 2, it tells us that we're to carry each other's burdens so that we can fulfill the law of Christ. You could say, oh, my spouse is in a bad mood. I'm just going to stay out of the way and ignore them. Or you can help carry their burden and help them work through what's ever bothering them. But that takes both spouses to engage and talk about it. One person shouldn't have to be the detective and pull and pry and coax and cajole to figure out what's going on. There needs to be a sharing of information. Um, number five, give them lots of information. Learn to think of control freaks as overprotective parents. One of the ways you can help them relax is to keep them informed. The more reassuring the information you have to give them, the more apt they are to let go. If you just resist them, they tend to become more controlling and they tend to believe they can't trust you. But if you can explain the facts and tell them why you're resisting or why you think there might be a better course of action and then want to talk to them about it, sometimes that's what it takes to calm them down. 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26 says, a servant of the Lord must not be quarrelsome but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change their heart and they will learn the truth. That's a good guide for dealing with control freaks. Number six, put everything in writing. One of the most annoying and frustrating things about control freaks is they resist any idea that's not their own or a new way of doing things. They need time to think about things or consider new or different ways of doing things. So the best way to help them is to put your ideas or your suggestions in writing or your concerns if you need to confront them about something. This will give them a chance to think about it. They won't have to wonder what you said because it's going to be written on a piece of paper right in front of them. Don't confront a control freak or expect them to talk about a situation right then because they're not going to agree with you the moment you confront them or present a new suggestion. So give them the facts to support why you believe what you do and why you're choosing to respond like you do. I had to recently do this in a relationship that ended um, with a control freak. After having gone through every step of scripture to resolve it, I put my concerns in writing. And I also had to put dates, times, places, names objective, logical, concrete information so that they could, the person could review it. And then stated my concerns and what I was hoping for. Unfortunately, it did not work out. Um, but do that, give it to them so that they can ponder it. It may improve the relationship between you and the controlling person. There are a number of scriptures that command us to write for the purpose of conveying truth to others. And in Habakkuk 2.2, we read, Then the Lord said to me, write my answer and my words plainly on a tablet so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. Write it down so that things can change. It seems like a tedious process, and it is, but sometimes it's the only thing that's going to make a difference. Number seven. Negotiate your role with the controller. If you're in a relationship with a control freak, you will probably have noticed a constant cycle of debating and arguing over small, stupid, insignificant things, like how you drive the car, how you cook the bacon, or how you mowed the lawn. They just want to argue and debate or nitpick. When you notice this repetitive cycle happening, make it a point to talk and address your concerns with the controlling person. Decide which one of you is best at this task and who should be in control of it. If they want to control the way you load the dishwasher, then perhaps they need to take responsibility for doing that every night. It's that simple. And I've learned not to get flustered when somebody wants to criticize the way I'm doing something. I will often say, would you like to take this on? Nine times out of ten, the answer is no. Okay, then back off and let me do what I need to do. If they don't like your recipe and constantly want to tell you how much better they could have cooked this, well, then invite them to do so. 
that way, whether you're at work, home, school, or church, you can remind them that we had a discussion about this and they agreed that they would back off and let this be your area of control. This too can seem like a lot of work, but it's an effective strategy for making the control freaks become more aware of their behavior and how annoying it is to other people. Jesus himself gave us guidance for this type of situation in Matthew 18, 15. It's a section on church discipline and conflict resolution. When he says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he listens to you, you've gained a brother. If a controller is annoying you and doing something hurtful or harmful, you have a responsibility, according to scripture, to confront the person about it privately and to speak the truth with love. And the best outcome is that you can be reconciled and things change. But that confrontation can push them away as well. Number eight, learn to take the good with the bad. Every one of us has some annoying tendencies. Every one of us likes to control things. If you come to my house and you want to fold my towels, I'm probably going to refold them because I like them folded a certain way. <laughs> and that can be irritating to people that just wanted to help. But I'm not going to lose a whole lot of sleep about my desire to control towel folding. But there are some things that can really get me. If, if you love me, you're going to let that slide. And I'm going to let some things slide if I think you're being controlling. It can be very difficult to stay in a close relationship with a control freak. It depends on how severe and intense and deep and wide your control issues are. But you know what? They do actually have some helpful advice and words of wisdom from time to time. But because they're always giving advice, you may have tuned them out and just learned to dismiss what they're saying because they're always telling you something to do and always have a suggestion. Try to pay attention to the suggestions that might really help you. Look for the positive in what they have to say, just not just the negative. Actually, in work settings, control freaks are often the ones that are given the most responsibility to get things done. And you know why? Because they're conscientious, they're detail-oriented, and they're dedicated. Keep this in mind the next time that you need to have a surgery. You probably want your surgeon to be a little bit of a control freak if they're about to cut into you and do some work on your insides. Or think about the next time an air traffic controller is giving instructions to your airplane pilot about takeoff or landing. You probably will be thankful that they're a little bit of a control freak. These are the times that control freaks can be invaluable to our health and safety. Proverbs 19.20 tells us that we're to listen to advice and accept instruction. And in the end, we'll be wise. When we grow in wisdom, we're willing to listen to counsel from wherever it comes. Balaam listened to his ass in the Old Testament, to his uh, safety and help. He would have died if he hadn't listened. God had his donkey talk to him and tell him, you don't want to do this, Balaam. Number nine, maintain your independence. While it's true that control freaks often have some good suggestions, you're guaranteed to find that many of their requests, instructions, and directions are unreasonable. They're just nitpicking. They're at you all the time. That's when it's time for you to become a little more assertive. Jesus had to do this with Peter. When Jesus told the disciples he was about to die and be resurrected, Peter disagreed with him and tried to tell Jesus what he should and shouldn't be doing. Jesus had to rebuke him sharply and said, you're a stumbling block to me. You don't have the mind of the things of God, but the things of men. From time to time, control freaks need to be reminded of the facts. They need to be confronted and stopped in what they're saying. Just because you extend grace and forbearance to them eight times out of 10, doesn't mean that you're going to do it on the ninth and the 10th time. I will put up with a lot, but there will come a point when enough is enough and I have to say something. It's possible to reassure them that you're for them, not against them, while expressing your own personal needs about what you will and won't tolerate from them. Ephesians 4.15 tells us that we're to grow up and learn how to speak the truth in love so that we can grow more and more Christ-like. 
Number 10, feed the emotional needs of the control freak. The author in the book says, stroke their ego. I don't like that and I'm not big at stroking egos, but uh, feed their emotional needs. This isn't meant to enable their bad behavior, but rather to encourage them to feel better about themselves. Remember control freaks suffer from low self-esteem much of the time. And they have a very low tolerance for painful emotions such as shame, fear, and rejection. And when they encounter them, their internal responses kick in automatically in order to help them cope with the situation. That's why they go into control mode. They have to do it to protect themselves. And they've learned to do that for years. Controllers need to be intentional in developing healthy self-esteem and an awareness of how God truly sees them. They need to allow safe, trusted people into their lives who will help reparent them and teach them that they are valuable and they don't need to be ashamed of their weaknesses. We all have them. You don't need to be ashamed of that. You know what? Some of the things that I've been made fun of are true. I didn't like being made fun of, but it didn't make the things they said any less true. Learning to laugh at yourself and not take yourself too seriously is a wonderful tool for being emotionally healthy and sound. But it's also because I've learned what God says about me and I believe what he says about me. Helping people to grow in their understanding of their value to the Lord is huge in helping them get free of their controlling behaviors. Once a person becomes more comfortable in their own skin and assured of their identity in Christ, their anxiousness will diminish and their need to dominate others will lessen. The good news is you don't have to be a doctor or a counselor to help control freaks. Simply look for opportunities to compliment them and build them up wherever possible. And I'm not talking about fake compliments. I'm talking about honest, genuine comments. Help them feel better about who they are, not what they do. Tell them if you think they're kind. Tell them if you think they showed great wisdom or good judgment. Don't say, oh, you're such a hard worker, because then what do they do? They think their worth is tied to what they do, and they say, we work harder. You're such a good singer. Okay, well, I'll go sing some more. No, speak to who they are as a person. We're exhorted in Romans 15, 1 through 2, that we who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. And lastly, and most importantly, and I'm going to say this probably applies to all of you in some way, shape, or form. We need to know when it's time to move on, to let go and move on. In some instances, the behavior of control freaks has become so much a part of who they are. Their fears are so deep and embedded that they are unwilling to change. In this case, no matter what you do, there will be little, if any, progress toward healing. If you feel like you're up against a brick wall with the controllers in your life, you run the risk of not only being constantly frustrated, but also of having your self-esteem eroded and being blamed for things that are not your fault. In some settings, controllers can even present a serious roadblock to your career or advancement whether it's in ministry, school, or work. The longer you stay in a relationship with a controller who is unwilling to change or acknowledge these inappropriate behaviors, you're putting your own self at risk. And you're going to be disillusioned and hurt over and over and over again. There is a time to end relationships with people who refuse to do the right thing. And the Bible warns us clearly about when we're to end relationships with other people. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, do not mis, uh, be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. If you are in a relationship longstanding and long-term with someone who will not do what scripture says, who is not interested in being teachable, corrected, or manifesting the fruit of the spirit, uh, that will eventually corrupt your good character, scripture says. Think long and hard. When I said the word the Lord's given me this hour is to assess, assess everything, assess your relationships. 
it's okay to step back. There are those of us who are the ones who always try, who always try to keep family connected, to keep friends connected. And it can be exhausting because what we find is when we stop trying, nobody tries in our place. And it lets us know that we didn't really matter to others like they mattered to us. It's, it's a hurtful thing, but it's better to grieve the, the relationship and step away and be able to be healthy. Um, Proverbs 22, 24 and 25 says, do not make friends with a hot tempered person. Do not associate with one who is easily angered or you may learn their ways and endanger your soul. We don't need these friendships if it can't be authentic and genuine and conducted according to scripture then it's probably not healthy for those who are trying to grow in christ likeness <clears throat> well at the end of the day control is a very elusive and deceptive concept and the thought of having no control is a fearful thing for many people Interestingly, our attempts to control others is about as effective as trying to hold on to a fistful of sand. And the harder we squeeze, the more we lose. The Bible's clear we're to maintain self control in our own lives. We are not commanded to control anyone else in any way, shape, or form. This type of control, self control, means that we're not driven to respond out of our emotions or our fear. Self-control means when I'm with a controller and they're trying to dictate me, I need to control my response. I don't need to control them. For many people, learning how to be self-controlled means you have to set healthy boundaries in your relationships. That means you've got to become aware of the ways in which you're trying to control people or outcomes and how you're allowing other people to control us. This applies not only in your relationships, but at work and in ministry and in governments. People, organizations, and governments may think they have control over people, but often the only control they have over us is what we allow them to have. There's a wonderful sense of peace and freedom that comes when we release our unhealthy need for control. So stop trying to change people. Stop trying to teach people that God didn't call you to teach and be ready to walk away when necessary. The Bible is clear. There's a time to walk away from toxic and controlling people. Titus 3.10 says, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. One thing is sure, if you continue to allow the control freaks in your life to manipulate you and steamroll over your boundaries, then they're not going to change. They control you and other people because they can because most people are unwilling to stand up to them and confront them. My prayer in this is that you will find the courage to speak the truth in love when necessary. I'm praying also that God through his Holy Spirit will embolden you and give you the words you need to speak in the days ahead. He is so faithful and he's true to his word and that scripture is just coming to me. Fear not what you'll say because I'll put the words in your mouth. That's in the New Testament. I'm not sure where it is. I'm here to tell you he does that. Because <laughs> I would spit and sputter a lot. And if I just ask him to guard my mouth and give me the words, he does. Try it. I dare you to try it. Let's just close in prayer. And if somebody has any comments, I'll linger. Otherwise, we'll be done. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time. I thank you, Lord, for the sharpness of your word that cuts through our logic and our emotions and go straight to our spirit man. Lord, I ask you to make us sharp and discerning and wise in the days ahead. Reveal to us every way that we are trying to control people, situations and outcomes. Reveal to us when we are speaking and giving advice and feedback where it was never asked for nor warranted. Reveal to us, Lord, where we're being critical, nitpicky, argumentative and debating for no reason. Keep us from becoming a quarrelsome and divisive people. Lord, I ask you to continue to knit your church together with one spirit, one mind, one heart, so that we might grow up and mature into unity, as your word says. 
Lord, I pray for every need that's represented on this call for the medical needs. Lord, I ask for a restoration of health and an acceleration of healing where needed. Lord, for provision for the days ahead, whether it's financial or material, food. Lord, I pray for community, healthy community to surround each of these people. People where they can trust uh, others to speak into their lives, where they dare to be vulnerable and share their heart, where they will take correction and learn how to speak the truth and love to others. We so desire, Lord, to get this right because you will, as Val said, have a bride that is pure and spotless and holy. We thank you for the opportunity to grow and change and ask your blessing on all that's been said and done here in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.